Good day. I'm Thomas Gopp from the University of Siegen. Today, I will discuss the imperial mode of living and the outlines of a society that is characterized by the good life for all. I will especially concentrate on examples from Tanzania, Croatia, Slovenia, and Germany. The idea of the uh, concept of the imperial mode of living is that there are many problems and that most people are aware of them, but nothing seems to change in a significant scale despite of this general awareness. Um, so um, what we see here is a vis visualization of this concept of the imperial mode of living. And here in the upper half, um, we see um, the characteristics of that um, way of life. Um, and the lower part, in the lower part, we see the reasons for why this way of life is so stable and uh, does not change easily. Um, so let's first start with the upper part. Um, the imperial mode of living is deeply anchored and stable to, um, uh, due to four different dimensions. And first, or one characteristic, is the exploitation of labor and the biosphere. And in general, we can say that the imperial mode of living uh, in, implies the seemingly unlimited access to all what we call the, or what I call the treasures of the earth. And that includes both the biosphere and human labor. Um, and here, when we talk at the biosphere, we mainly talk of oh, one key um, component is the concept of the planetary boundaries, um, which was developed by Rückström et al. Um, we see that actually when we think of um, or what often is mentioned as a key problem in, in the human nature relation to climate crisis is not even the worst. We have some dimensions where humans are already way beyond what the planetary boundaries would allow human society to live within, which is here the biodiversity loss and the nitrogen cycle. But we see here the climate crisis is already um, in the red area. Um, and just as an example, when we look here at a mobile phone, um, this is uh, or such a smartphone is made of 60 different, different resources or materials. And in addition to plastic, glass, and ceramics, there are at least 30 different types of metal that are being processed in there. Uh, second is the exploitation of labor. Um, labor is a very important issue because it forms the social basis for living and for doing business. Um, and however, the products are often only affordable because people work under the most difficult conditions, such as a low social and environmental standards in many workplaces. And that actually is what makes consumer products easily affordable for a growing middle class and upper class in the whole world. And one example is when we look at Apple's iPhone, when we look here at the distribution of the revenue, we see that here um, 3.5 and 1.8, so together 5.3% of the actual sales price is the only amount that goes to salaries. While here 58% um, is uh, Apple's gross profits, and these are essentially all the all is the part of the revenue that remains within the United States. It's not pure profits, so this also includes the money that is spent for advertisement, for product development, etc. So let's come to the next characteristics of the imperial mode of living, which is um, the actual pushing of costs onto the other people. The reason behind that is that to enable the imperial mode of living, people all over the world have to work hard. They extract mineral resources and other things. And this takes place on a scale that pushes actually the Earth's ecological and social limits. And the consequences of these are outsourced in three dimensions. First is the global south. Second are future generations. And third are poorer people who live right um, or disadvantaged groups who live everywhere right now. And with that, one could actually say that our environment does not see, is not being seen as a value in itself, but is exclusively used as a source of raw materials and a dump for, um, for waste. So now we first think of the temporary externalization. Well, as I said, that um, refers to the to the outsourcing of externalities to common generations. 
and that most prominently is climate change. So that is the uh, combination of the of the atmosphere with CO2 emissions. And as we see here, this has risen for like very substantially for about 150 years since the industrial revolution. And when we look where actually all these uh, emissions come from, we see a very interesting picture. Here, these are the per capita, that means the per head CO2 emissions based by some or for some selected countries. And we see here that the United States are at the very top, and then Germany comes like only like two thirds of that, Slovenia also. And um, here, this is the world average. So all these countries that we see here are above the world average and also other countries who are actually, who reduce that average from all these high emitting countries are countries such as Tanzania, like low income countries. Um, and actually already now, we, when we look, for example, at seaweed farmers in Zanzibar, they face substantial challenges as a result of climate change because they need the, to shift their plantations to deeper waters because of the water temperature. And there they are threatened by the, what is called the ice ice disease. And um, that's what we see here in the picture. And that actually happens when the changes in the ocean temperatures stresses the seaweeds and that makes them produce this uh, substance here that attracts bacteria. And this will even become worse when global, global climate changes increases. So this was now the first dimension of the outsourcing, the temporal dimension, and now we look at the spatial dimensions. And um, what we have here is a picture now from the living sphere of, 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 of digitality is uh, like an illustration of the content management of Facebook. As you might know, many of these uh, content management centers are located in low income, low income countries. And what the people do there is to moderate the contents on Facebook or like that's just an example. Of course, it's also true for other social media. And given what they have to see there all the time is illustrated by that graph that this, that has the potential to essentially break down people when they have to watch eight hours, 10 hours per day, six eight days per week, all these horrible images that are then to be deleted from the platform. Another dimension of spatial externalization comes here from South Africa. Um, which is uh, a picture of an area where gold mines uh, located. You know that most of the gold or some such a share of the gold that is produced today is actually uh, produced to produce digital devices because they all include gold. Um, and what happened there was that the groundwater and the surface water was um, polluted with acid mine drainage and that has exposed the residents to living around or who are living around these mines to high concentrations of heavy metals, which is, of course, a substantial health risk. Now let's come to the third dimension of, um, of, um, uh, of the imperial mode of living, which is the exp uh, expansion and in intensification. Um, and despite all of these problems that we just mentioned, the imperial mode of living is spreading from the global north to more, more parts of the world. Um, and that goes along with all these difficult ecological problems and social injustice. So let's first talk about the expansion, which is, um, yeah, which takes place at a, at a, um, at a, uh, um, surface <laughs> uh, dimension. So what we see here is just the annual size of the global data sphere measured as zeta bytes. So this is essentially the size of the internet. And what we see here is, yeah, can be considered some sort of uh, exponential growth. And now I would like to highlight, oops, what happened here? Sorry. Now I would like to highlight the example of the Intel Ocotillo campus, which is a manufacturer plant for um, Intel microchips in Arizona. Um, as one can see here from the pictures, but well, as you probably might know already, Arizona is a very dry area. And this is about water use. So in Germany, for example, the daily household water use per, per person is 100, 120 liters. Now, what does this manufacturing plant let, use? They use 325,000 liters. And if you remember, here is this drop. This 
graph is actually in the correct ratio. So this is the amount of water that one, like this small little drop that we cannot even see anymore, is the amount of water that one family uses per day. And this big uh, dark blue rectangle is the amount that this uh, factory uses every day. Now, in addition to this issue of, um, of the geographical expansion, is the fact that the um, imperial mode of living also um, penetrates more and more spheres of the daily life. And things that used to be done previously privately or in the family are now being part of the market. And one example here is, again, the internet, where what used to be done like as, uh, as just free voluntary work, people who created many websites are now doing this um, as part of their income source. And this is actually called intensification, where the market and the power concentration increases more and more. Now, this was the third dimension of, uh, of the um, imperial mode of living. So let's now come to the fourth dimension, which is in, um, exclusivity. And this is one of the very basic principles of the imperial mode of living. The idea here is that there's a so-called inside and an outside. Now, for example, consider the power of different passports. We see that here in the diagram where the power of passport means how many countries one can visit um, without a visa. And here we see our, for example, countries, Germany, Slovenia, Croatia, and Tanzania. And as we can see here, Germany is uh, like the second rank in the world in terms of how many countries German residents can, uh, can, can visit without any visa. We also see that here on the map where the power for the power of a country is indicated by light colors. And here we see here that's Western Europe. We can also think or see that this is pretty much similar to the Schengen area, which belongs here to the top countries in the world. Here, North America is doing pretty well. East Asia, specifically Japan, Australia, New Zealand, with South America, here especially Brazil is a little bit lighter, but you see that here these uh, emerging economies are already not as uh, far as the European countries and their offshots. Um, there's clearly a link between uh, the ability to travel and the average incomes. Um, and when you think about this, uh, or one cynical component of that, is that actually the reason why people are allowed to travel is to is, is, is for fun, for leisure. Many of these vis-a-vis -vis countries grant these uh, the opportunity to travel their countries for free because people are welcomed as tourists who strengthen the uh, economy. And the cynical thing here is that apparently it's allowed to travel for fun, but not for survival when you consider um, movements of, uh, of refugees. Um, and now, having talked about these four dimensions of characteristics of the imperial mode of living, we now look at the reasons for why this system is so stable. And there are actually, again, four dimensions. So first refers to what one can also uh, refer to as the mental infrastructure, everything that has something to do with cultures, so norms, habits, knowledge, and desire. Second is the physical infrastructure, third institutions, and fourth are pseudo solutions. Now we're going through them individually. So as mentioned, these habits, knowledge, and desires, they are essentially the culture of a country, all of the ideals and more. And the imperial mode of living is actually based on the ideal of constantly available consumer goods. So briefly mentioned, it is called everything, everywhere, and anytime. And one uh, component of that is, for example, the increasing normality of um, digital devices all over the world and to be used for every component or many, an increasing number of components of daily life. Um, second is the uh, traveling. So um, for um, a substantial share of humanity, it's just a normal thing that if you can afford it, you go traveling. Another thing is fancy cars, whatever. So and it's uh, the, the norm in many societies that if you can afford it, you just do that because it's uh, part of an affluent and well-fulfilled life. Now, the second pillar for the um, imperial mode of living is the material infrastructure. 
So here we talk about path dependencies mainly. So one example here is the existing transportation network. For example, when you live in a rural area, it is often not so easy to get around if you don't have a car. So actually the lack of transport, uh, public transportation, the existence of a dense road network is the physical infrastructure then that leads to a non-sustainable behavior of the people. And it is very important here that this is actually like, this is like lying there in concrete that cannot be changed by an individual, no matter how hard one tries. Um, another example for infrastructure is here, um, what we know in the European Union, the um, warning app or the, 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 the mobile phone app that shows that one is vaccinated and that had during the height of the corona pandemic an essential role because this app allowed people to enter um, to enter certain venues. And here the path dependence is that one needs essentially this mobile phone and without that mobile phone one cannot um, yeah cannot participate in society. Now the third dimensions are political institutions. Um, um, and what we see here is an example of political institutions, namely um, fortified borders. And what we see here is how um, a, a, only a small share of the world's population, but that controls a major share of the world's income, is here concentrated behind borders. And here there are something like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven boards, seven international borders that um, basically protect these, uh, these, this part of the world. Uh, another example is the tax system in Germany through which, through which the country subsidizes air travel to the tune of about 10 billion euros per year. And this, for example, materializes in tax-free kerosene or the fact that there's no value added tax on international flights. And now finally, the fourth contributor to the stability of the imperial mode of living are pseudo solutions. Um, and these are defined as marked market conforming processes that promise to solve problems on a technical level. However, while they're indeed often well intended and they do reduce the negative, uh, the negative impacts, they also are part of the system. And just by their sheer existence, they strengthen an unsustainable system because they falsely suggest that continuing with a business as usual is actually or can be a solution. And one example for that is green IT. And as you uh, know, in order to keep, up to, uh, to keep up to date, to keep working with current software, to have a system that is well protected against viruses and other malware, one actually needs um, um, like a functioning and up-to-date laptop in many situations. And of course, this fundamental process, uh, pr problem is not solved by now arguing, well, one can now make some of these resources more conflict-friendly or more environmental-friendly. And a second example is here, uh, what is here illustrated as a green airplane. This is set, uh, or an example for that is compensating the CO2 emissions um, of a flight. But of course, these CO2 emissions still occur and would be better to not fly at all. Um, and the, the problem with these pseudo solutions is that they influence discussions in such a way that the actual fundamentals um, remain the same. So the question that one asks, like how many things have to change in order for the sustain uh, this insustainable way of living may, may remain. And of course, that um, is not going to work. So to sum up all these dimensions of the persistence, um, one can say that in many cases, the same person is both exploiter and being exploited. For example, think of a poor person who is exploited him or herself, but owns a smartphone, which comes with all these difficult conditions in for the environment and the labor when producing it. Um, so we can conclude that the imperial mode of living is not only around us, it is actually within us, and it is reinforced by these pseudo solutions that we have down here. And through this anchoring and the normality that I'm talking about uh, the cultures, um, it is somewhat invisible. And, and that actually may explain why it often appears 
that nothing changes or at least in a not fast enough pace. And summing all these up and giving the current state of the world, especially I talk about climate change and loss of biodiversity, etc. The question is not anymore if things will change because we know that they are going to change because if we continue as it is now and we will have substantial climate change, we will have rising of the oceans, the drastic changes in, in temperatures, etc. So here we know that and if we, if we don't want that, we have to change other things. So again, the, the question is not if something changes, but how other things are going to change. And the question is, are they going to change by design and or by disaster? And what I'm going to show now in the second half of this presentation is an idea on how these change can be implemented by design and not by disaster. And for this, we have the, uh, the concept of the solitary based mode of living. And in this, um, in this mode of living, that is most easily defined as not living at the expense of others. And of course, that is somewhat simplistic to define something as being not something else, rather than what it actually is. Um, however, it is difficult to spell that out in detail for a number of reasons. First, everything in, in the sphere is contextual. So it, there might be, or um, there's like definitely no one size fits all solution for the whole world. And this is why in the following, we generate or we develop some characteristics that shape the solidarity solidarity based mode of living, but it's not a, a too clear uh, cooking book recipe, let's say. Um, and all these alternative, uh, alternatives are based on a collection of, the exi of existing alternatives and ideas. And from these ideas, one can deduct and distill principles of a solidarity-based mode of living. Um, and essentially, or the, the final goal there is to create a society that is completely free of exploitation and discrimination. So let's have a brief view, uh, brief, brief view, brief view at that uh, image that is similar to the image of the imperial mode of living. And now in the following, we will look at several practical examples that are structured around the five principles of the solidarity-based mode of living here in the upper half. Um, and they can be designed or they can be understood as the outline of the good life for all. And actually all of them somewhat overlap and feed into each other. Um, so let's start here with care. The logic of care here on the right side of the picture is essential for the solidarity-based mode of living. And it consists of two components of reproduction and the interdependence on nature. So instead of production, we focus here on reproduction because the purpose of the economy as a whole is to serve the people's need. And it's not the other way around. It's always that like the people are first and the economy is the mean to achieve the good life for all. And it's not the people that have to live to be slaves to the economy. Um, and the standard of all activities should be that, um, that, that is to, to preserve life and to develop and to cultivate relationships. And this involves social relationships, such as care activities, including raising children and caring for the elderly, but also, of course, the cultivation of friendships. And on the other hand, uh, we humans, and, and like the humans and the nature, we are inseparable. And in the empirical mode, uh, imperial mode of living, the nature is thought of as something external that can be exploited at will. Um, however, the logic of care emphasizes that humans actually depend on nature and the two are not separable from each other. Um, and now we come to two examples where this materializes very well. So the first one here is I, um, what we see here, it's a practical permaculture institute on Zanzibar. So this is a project for permaculture on Zanzibar. And here the idea is that instead of industrial agriculture, in which the nature is exploited, the soils are depleted and kept running with chemicals. Oh, um, here in the permaculture project, 
um, uh, it emphasizes a philosophy um, of, uh, of a spirit of with nature, as they say themselves. And that means that it, uh, the nature is thought of in cycles to care for and about the earth, and this is an essential component. And here we have a second example, the crater project from, from Slovenia in Ljubljana. So this is an emerging production space which sprouted from a yeah, neglected and kind of like crater resembling construction site near the city center of Ljubljana. And there in, in the crater, there are very site-specific production stations for many different things, such as paper making workshops, wood workshops and miso design which upper which is a lab that operates along the principles of open access and seeks to create a dialogue with nature and um, just two examples for project that they conduct there is first to apply um, local soil and clay and gravel in construction site and a second example is a prototype of planting plots that are created by compressing different types of recycled materials into a functional forms and yeah, such as flower pots. Now let's come to the second dimension of the solidarity-based mode of living, and this is democratization. Uh, sorry, it's a third dimension already. Um, and the idea here, it's also very simple, is that all people should have the opportunity to shape their lives and everything that touches their lives. And fundamental to this axis are participation, temporal and emotional capacity, education, and security. And democratization, the principle as it, spells, as it, is, spells, uh, as it is spelled out here, creates all these conditions, um, together with uh, the corresponding decision-making procedures. And actually, interestingly enough, in this sphere of life, Digitalization can be helpful now, on the other hand. Before, digitalization was only a problem. And one example comes here from Slovenia again, where you, uh, there, there is a process that is called the youth participatory budget. And this is actually uh, based on the idea that one wants the young people make part of the decision-making pro process on how the budget of this municipality is spent. And since the youth are often not really located in our, like on the, on the daily routine, they are not in this, in this municipality because they go to school and that is often somewhere else, they could not rely on the young people really being present in person. And this is why um, the, uh, the people in charge at the municipality decided to create this online tool here where the youth of this municipality could influence on how the budget is spent through this online tool. And here, a set, second example for the democratization process is the Tumbatu community, uh, community Hall on Zanzibar. And here, the idea is that um, um, the, the, the participants who, who come to that place, here we have men in this picture, here we have women, is that they decide together on um, very low level community affairs. And one example is the joint decision making on how and where to bury their loved ones when somebody passes away, or second, um, the, to take the decisions on where to go for cultivation in, the, uh, in their land because this is done in order to allow the land to rejuvenate, which is a yeah, part of sustainable agricultural practices. Now, the next dimension of the solidarity base of living is what is called commoning. So here we have, um, um, or oh, sorry, first, it's, it's a picture um, of the octopus fishing in Tubatu, the same area where we just saw the community hall in the previous picture. And here, this co community also jointly decides on three months prohibitions for octopus fishing, because after one month, uh, uh, after each one month period, the octopus population decreases, and they want to give them three months to regrow or to um, to regenerate. However, there the problem is when outsiders come who are not from this area who don't respect these locally decided. Um, um, and uh, uh, fishing grounds, so let's say. Um, and in general, one can say that commoning is about the process 
of, uh, of how people produce and use goods and services collectively. So these commons, they do not belong to one person as a private property. Instead, they are available for use for all on an equal basis. Um, and how these commons are actually used is always like the result of a negotiation process, but in a democratic um, decision making. Um, and there, the, essentially, it leads to a world in which the people are not um, separated to producers and consumers, but everybody can become a co-producer or co-creator, I can also say, sorry. Um, and how this is then done, yeah, depends, of course, always on the respective case. And one example here is the Wikipedia, where yeah, all people over the world can, um, can participate. And this is another example where digitalization actually might help to increase uh, the common. And now we have a third example for, for the commoning, which is the um, Roji Community Center in Croatia. And in this community, about 108 civil, to civil society organizations invested jointly to renovate the space um, by using their own resources. So here you see how it looked like before, and here on the bottom um, pictures, you see how it looks like right now. Um, and the interesting thing there is that these 108, like just imagine the sheer number, the 108 institutions had to find a way to cooperate and to use the building in a way um, that it forms a non-formal self-management. And uh, the, what's called the Roche, uh, Roche, um, sorry, the Roche uh, Association Alliance was established in 2012, and this governs now the community center as a common resource. And now as the final principle of the solidarity-based mode of living, we have sufficiency. Um, you know, like on one hand, this is all always about all people having enough to live, and especially how those who now don't have enough can satisfy their basic needs. But on the other hand, there are substantial amounts of people who are affluent and who have today more than they actually probably would need to survive. Um, and for them, the solidarity mode of living is more about breaking the logic of growth and using less resources by sharing, by recycling, and actually even renouncing. And to illustrate that, we now have, again have an example from Croatia. And what we see here is a bicycle repair shop in Zagreb. And this essentially teaches users about how to repair their bikes. And um, these repairs actually have to be carried out by the users themselves. There are only volunteers present who are there for advice. And also what's um, happening there is that old bikes can actually be donated for from by people who don't need them anymore in order for people who don't have the means to to allow their own bikes to get some bikes for free and that also then leads to a safe uh, saving of material resources of course now now we have talked about here this upper half of this uh, picture the features of the solidarity based mode of living um, however, there are also now the foundations, which I'm going to talk about next. So these are the basically the guiding principles or the foundations here, the pillars that make the solidarity-based mode of living being introduced and being ensured to keep existing. And now we first have a look at the basic human needs, and this is completely different from the economic system that we have right now, because it challenges the, yeah, the neoclassic concept, let's say, of needs, which are, according to neoclassics, unlimited. So unlimited. So the idea is that more is always better. And, and this actually means that these, um, um, and, and the mean at the same time, while we always achieve more, are trying to achieve more and more, the means to achieve these needs are, uh, are limited. And now the solidarity based model of living turns this understanding completely upside down by finding that the actual needs are limited and the other only thing that is unlimited are the satisfier. So here we have uh, a quote from the Chilean, uh, Chilean economist uh, Manfred Max Neve who essentially says that here, these are the basic human rights, freedom, identity, creation, idleness, participation, assigning, affection, protection, and subsistence. Subsistence includes 
food, shelter, clothing, etc. And as you see, like these are limited. There is no need for having more food than one needs for subsistence because that's how it is defined. And what is argued then is that there are an endless way of um, possibilities to satisfy these needs without the requirement for um, for, for for economic growth. Um, a second way is um, to look at the material infra, oh, sorry, the 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 day to day practices and desires. And this essentially means that one, re one needs a societal change towards a normality that follows the principles of the good life for all. That sounds pretty simple, but of course, they're devilish in detail because it really means that for the people who are already affluent, they have to cut down. It has to be the normality, and one has to justify themselves for using an excessive amount of resources. Um, here are the material infrastructures. So that means that um, essentially, as I said before, today cities are dissolved. Many living spaces are designed in a way that one cannot navigate them without the car. And one positive example where the, this infrastructure was completely changed is Copenhagen, where the entire city was um, re-transformed to a bicycle city. And then they did, uh, they, they conducted a survey to ask, why do you actually cycle? Do you uh, try to uh, avoid traffic congestion? Do you like a better environment? Is it good for your health? Is it better for the urban lives, etc.? And actually, what it what, what what became clear is that only a small fraction of the people who now use their bikes do that because it is ec ecological. And there are many other reasons why people use bikes in these days. And this is very interesting because that means that it is more convenient for the people. Like the real people say it's faster, it's cheaper, it's just more convenient, more easy to take a bike. So this somehow um, turns up the logic of one has to be willing to do something good to save the environment. No, it depends on the surrounding infrastructure and institutions. And this actually means that here we have a set of institutions and infrastructure that make it more easy, more convenient to do what is environmentally sustainable. Sustainable. Now let's come to the example of political institutions. And we have three examples here. First are a practice of um, repair vouchers from uh, in Vienna, which is now actually extended. Like here, this was limited to the beginning of last year in 2021. But now this was actually extended to the whole of Austria. And this means here that one can um, go somewhere with uh, any broken device, like a washing machine. And then, um, and with this, uh, with this voucher, which can just, one can just simply print off the internet, that one can give it to the person, one only has to pay half of the price, and the other half is paid by the government. So this increases um, the amount and increases the motivation to, to repair old stuff instead of buying new stuff. A second example is the Rio Earth Summit, which was already there in 1992, which um, uh, empowered the um, uh, indigenous knowledge versus WTO regulations on biopiracy. However, unfortunately, here we see that um, this is a rather weak legislation. And if these two conflict, the double, like the World Trade Organization rules on intellectual property, when they conflict with this Rio Earth Summit declaration on the importance of the, um, of, of the indigenous knowledge, then unfortunately the World Trade Organization law is stronger. So here we also see an attempt on by changing this institution by making at the international level at the United Nations, this requirement stronger than the rules of the World Trade Organization. And now a third example here was the cleanup waste collectors in Arusha in northern Tanzania. Um, and these were, this was here um, undertaken by, by, by volunteers, but of course the, um, the, 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 uh, the Tanzanian government and also governments could make this a government plan to reduce uh, the trash that is lying around on the countryside. Another example for institutions that improve the, um, the living sphere is also from Tanzania, where, there, where plastic bags are forbidden. So it's illegal to introduce plastic bags into Tanzania and also illegal to use them there. 
And now as a final principle for the solidarity-based mode of living is subsidiarity and democratic control. And here the, the, the idea of subsidiarity means that everything that can be decided at the lowest level, at the local level should be taken, or every decision that can be taken at the local level should be taken at the local level or more general. And everything that is, everything should be decided <clears throat> at the lowest level that is possible for this decision to be made. And that regards taxes, subsidies, community affairs, working hours, whatever. Now, to sum up so the solidarity-based mode of living, as you can see here, we have the same structures as before. So here we have the characteristics and we have, here we have the foundations, but in this case, they are radically redesigned. Also, there are different principles by which the solidarity based mode of living operates. And as you see, there are here many additional arrows, all in this picture here, here, and here. And um, this is there to indicate that this is not meant to be a complete master plan, but that these principles must always be up for discussion and that they can also change over time. So this was it now, from the imperial mode of living to the good life for all. I thank everybody who watched that video for their attention and yes, all the best and have a nice day.